Indira Naidu, and I'm thrilled to be your host for our wonderful Sydney Writers' Festival. It's going to be such a special night, a chance to relive a key moment in history with the historical figure at the centre of that moment. We don't often get this chance, so it's going to be very special. Now, the book, of course, that we're exploring tonight okay. marks 10 years since Australia's first female Prime Minister gave her explosive not now, not ever speech. So, what was it about that speech, that blast of feminist fury that resonated not only here, but right around the world? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Australia's first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. into my lair. <laughs> I was going to say the band's back together again. Yeah, the band yeah. is back together again. <laughs> now, Julia, welcome Thank to this you. night. Very, very special. It's been a year of marking, commemorating the 10th year anniversary of that not now, not ever, that misogyny speech. You've been around the country. You've done events internationally. How, how does that feel? Because at the time when the speech happened, the Australian media misread it. Everyone was focused on the politics of the time, not really understanding the nature of the substance of what you said in that particular bit of the speech. When did you realise that it actually was profound for a number of people? Was there a moment or an incident that, that made you realise that? Well, I'd have to say in terms of recognising uh, the ongoing ramifications of the speech, I think I was a bit of a slow coach. Um, Wayne Swan, who was in the parliament with me, recognised it instantaneously and I thought he was being, you know, a bit melodramatic. Uh, and by the, but by the time I went back to my office after question time, we were starting to get calls and emails and there was obviously this community reaction that was quite different to the media reaction. But I don't think the penny really, really dropped for me until I was, as Prime Minister, travelling internationally. And quite quickly after the misogyny speech, I went to India on a, a Prime Ministerial visit. And amongst the team was an Indian policewoman. And as I came off the plane, you know, down the steps into the car, she's in the front seat of the car, I'm sitting behind her, and she just turns around and says, great speech. <laughs> and I thought, right, this is, this is kind of quite a thing now. <laughs> oh, that must be so surreal. <laughs> Very surreal. Yeah. Julie, you say in Not Now, Not Ever, uh, the book that you have edited with contributions from leading women academics and activists around the world, that you said that the actual speech, very little of it was actually planned. In fact, you just had a, a few scrawl notes and somehow from that became this explosive, fury-filled speech that we all know now. So, so tell us how you found the words and, and why you ended up expressing them the way you did. Uh, that speech was in the moment. I didn't know that we were going to be having that kind of debate in Parliament. I'd got ready for question time. You know, they ask a question, you do your best to defend, they ask another question. And I knew that the theme of the day was going to be on sexism and misogyny because of political circumstances around the then Speaker of the House of Representatives. And so I had asked my staff to deliver to me sort of Tony Abbott's top ten sexist quotes. So I did... <laughs> Did, did have those with me. And I have subsequently joked that of the research tasks I'd set them as Prime Minister, that was by no means the hardest. They um, <laughs> delivered it all very, very quickly. Um, So I, I had those with me and I was intending a question had come in, I'd use one with a flourish and then another question would come in, I'd use another one. 
But then we moved instantaneously to this debate. So I really only had the time that Tony Abbott was speaking to organise my thoughts. And someone on the back bench did yell, um, he needs a mirror, and so I... Um, and then on, once someone on the back bench has used a good line, then, you know, several people tend to repeat it. And so there was this chorus of he needs a mirror. I thought, that's a really good line. Uh, so, you know, it, but it was coming, coming in the flow. And I at no point felt kind of, you know, women particularly have said to me, you know, when I get angry, I get teary. Um, and, you know, that means people think that I'm upset when really I'm angry. And it really makes me angry that people think I'm upset when I'm angry. Um, you know, didn't you feel teary and that kind of stuff. And I am capable of getting, I'm not angry often, but I do know what, it, what it's like to be in that state of angry, teary. But this felt different. It was a kind of cool, more forensic sort of anger. Mm. <laughs> How do you feel now, 10 years on, when you look back at the vision of that speech and, and that youngest version of you giving it? I've never watched it oh. from way to go. Not once, not ever. Um, I've... <laughs> not once, not, not ever. Not now, not uh, ever. Could be the next book. Um, <laughs> I, of course, I've seen extracts of it, but I have never uh, sat down and watched it from woe to go. And I've been quite deliberate about that. Um, I mean, one, I never liked watching myself on TV. I n <laughs> never liked doing that. Uh, but it's more specific than that, which is I really don't want my memories of the day to be overlaid by the vision. By the, by the outside of you uh, that the camera necessarily gives you rather than seeing the scene through my eyes. I want my memories of the day to be my original recollections. So mm. no, I haven't ever watched it and I don't imagine I ever will. Isn't that interesting? And so when it comes to how you remember that day, what is, is there an emotion that stays with you? Because often, if, if I ever lose my, my temper and get angry, I, I sometimes can feel quite, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. But after you said that, did you feel that that was a release? I'm so glad I finally said it. Not really. Um, I, I felt this, you know, growing frustration as we got closer and closer to question time that I knew that the opposition's attack was going to be framed as me being a hypocrite on sexism. And I did have, and, you know, I don't want to use bad language in a big group, uh, but I did have going through my mind, you know, for goodness sake... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oh, words to that or effect. Or insert your own word. <laughs> words to that effect. Um, you know, after everything I've just kind of taken on the chin and not responded to, now I'm the one in Australian politics, now it's going to be me, after all of that, uh, who apparently has to put up with the accusations of sexism. So I did feel, you know, this sort of frustration, this, you know, anger building... And I could always feel as I walked towards the chamber the kind of kick of adrenaline for the contest to come. And I really distinctly remember feeling that very strongly that day, but it made me feel very cool, very loose, very in the moment rather than nervous or anxious. And at the end of it, I just felt incredibly calm. It seems as if there'd almost been a bit of a delay with the Australian public in the significance of this speech. Is that, is that what you've felt as you've gone around the country? Yeah, I certainly have felt that. I mean, all of this, the book, the stage shows, it was all and continues to be a fundraiser for the Global Institute for Women's Leadership where we're trying to, you know, get more research, more evidence about what best clears barriers out of the way to enable women to become leaders. But I actually think it's about a maturing of our conversation about gender and I think people look back at those times and some of the treatment of me and really just, you know, put their head in their hands and, you know, what were we thinking? What, what were we thinking that, 
we ever conducted ourselves like that in Australian politics and we can do better than that and we should do better than that and I think we are doing better than that. Uh, that that more positive you know gentle supportive emotion i think then gets expression towards me as a person which is lovely uh, but more important than that really is that it gets expression towards the cause mm. it was a very volatile time then uh, when i look back and look back at the speech the images uh, the protests, the, the violent language, I, I'm extra I can't even believe it was a few years ago. And when we were doing the stage shows, you explained why it did take you so long to call out the misogyny that um, you were being subjected to. And you said you expected people would eventually just get used to a woman being prime minister and it just didn't seem to happen. I did think that over time, you know, when I first became Prime Minister, there'll be a big reaction to me being the first woman, and then people will get used to it and it will abate. And I was unprepared for the fact that it actually got worse and worse and the gendered insults became so much the go-to weapon in politics. And because I hadn't raised it earlier, it was hard to raise it later. Hmm. I mean, you came through, you know, law, the, the unions, uh, you can cut and thrust on the parliamentary floor, floor with the best of them, but those attacks from the opposition did become very personal and, and very gendered. When you look back at that time and when you cross paths with a, a Tony Abbott, how much of the personal still stays with you? I don't actually cross paths with Tony Abbott <laughs> all that much. <laughs> I, I do uh, get asked uh, questions like this uh, and, you know, I, I think that people imagine that we all go and retire to some special <laughs> retirement village together and, and, you know, we're there playing cards and, and <laughs> you know, oh, back in the day, like, you know, old, old prize fighters nursing their, uh, nursing their injuries, you know, what, wasn't I good? No, I got you that day, mate, you know. Um, we, we don't actually do that. So, <laughs> uh, thank heavens. Uh, so, I've only seen, I'm pretty sure this is right, I've only seen Tony Abbott twice in all these years in between. Um, one was in the flight lounge in Melbourne, uh, waiting to get the plane to Canberra, and this quite agitated staff member came over and she's like, oh, you know, it's confidential, but I think you should know. And anyway, it's confidential who's in the lounge, but I think I should tell you, Tony Abbott's about to come into the lounge. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. And he did, you know, I'm sitting visibly in the lounge. He walked in and you could, you could feel the whole place. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, people, it was breakfast time, people like cup of coffee halfway to their lips, <laughs> uh, about to take a little bite of toast, um, and they're all frozen in the moment. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't, I thought, this could soon degenerate into calls of fight, fight, fight. <laughs> like, you know, I've, got to, I've, got to, I've got to do something about this. Um, and I'd seen him, I wasn't sure in that moment that he'd seen me, but I walked up and I said, Tony, um, you know, but, and chatted to him and that sort of took the temperature down in the lounge that everybody's like, oh, thank goodness, it's going to be OK. Um, and I ended up saying something to him like, you know, uh, I know how hard campaigning is and I, um, you know, wish you personally well for the uh, weeks to come, but not too well because I want you to lose. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and he sort of, you know, laughed and said, you know, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Now, Julie, you sound so magnanimous when you talk about um, that period and, and some of the key players. And I wanted to explore this idea that we don't hear talked about much when it comes to politics. It's always grudges that go on for decades and generations. But it sounds like forgiveness is, is the tone that you're applying here. I, I mean, I think it's... Um it's a bit of forgiveness and it's uh, intentional forgetfulness. Um, I, I knew from my earlier life, before I went into politics, that sitting on a grudge does more damage to the person who does it 
than it ever does to the pers person, the subject of the grudge. And I worked that out way back when, when I was a young lawyer at Slater and Gordon. And many people would have, you know, something bad had happened to them at work. But you knew if they walked in with what in the old days would have been lever arch folders full of documents and they started off by saying, it all started 14 years ago. And even if something bad had happened, there was just part of me who always wanted to put the lawyer thing aside and say, as one human being to another, you are going to live a happier life if you go home tonight and you put all of that in the incinerator and you burn it or you shred it and you just forget it and you move on. And so when it all was happening to me, you know, I had that voice in the back of my head, you know, time to take your own advice. And I knew ultimately that was about me and my state of well-being and it's enabled me to draw a line and to embrace this bit of my life. And I think if you can't do that, if you're always thinking to yourself, if only I was back there, if only X had happened or Y had happened instead of what actually was the, the course of events, then you're forever stuck. And, you know, I came out, I'm hopefully still got many years to live, but I came out of politics a pretty young woman in many ways. And you've got to make a fairly deliberate decision. What do you want the next 20, 30, 40 years of your life to be about? And I didn't want it to be about grinding the axe. Mm. Julia, you now chair the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. So, 10 years on from that speech, what wins do you think we've made? Oh, I think, we've, I think we have made some wins. Uh, I think this more mature conversation we're having, human beings don't fix things unless we get together and we talk about them and we think about them. Uh, the number of women that we see on the public stage um, has certainly increased. I mean, one of the under-remarked things about the uh, Labor government winning uh, nationally is it's a government that is truly half-half, men and women. And once you get there, that forever changes how politics looks and it changes what politics talks about, the issues that are there for resolution. I think we've seen a lot of change in corporate Australia, much more thought about uh, women leading businesses. I think we've seen a lot of change in how uh, the younger generation thinks and talks about these things. But there are some ways that we've gone back and certainly I think the sort of social media stuff drags us back and I am worried that you know, that social media is now giving birth to a movement which is a sort of misogyny strike back uh, and that if we're not very careful, that means that this sense of progress will be diminished. And even with the sense of progress, we're not moving quickly enough. So part of the mission of the Institute is to say, what works? How can we do it ever more quickly? What is the, you know, change that gives us the biggest impact so that we can reach gender equality in far less than 100 years, which is the kind of estimates that we get now? Mm. I mean, social media has become a particular monster on a number of fronts, but it is so per pervasive. How, how would you suggest we, we grapple with that when it comes to tackling misogyny? Look, I think there's a regulatory piece here that governments have to think about and people may well see uh, in the news that, you know, governments around the world are trying to do some things. I can't accept a world in which, you know, I couldn't ring up uh, an Australian newspaper or email into an Australian newspaper and ask for an advertisement to be published which was threatening to kill someone or rape someone. That wouldn't happen. Uh, and yet those things can be put on social media without, you know, algorithms coming and fixing them. Uh, and if they ever do, they do it grudgingly and late. So I do think there's a regulatory piece and then I think there's a community conversation to be had about how much of our lives we want to live in that medium as opposed to doing things like this. And I think people are ready for that conversation, the sense that this is degrading our lifetime experience, not enhancing it, I think is very solidly out there. Mm. 
Julia, I want to explore the idea of grace. Again, a word that isn't often associated with politicians in the political world. Hillary Clinton writes in this book that you did, you made that speech with grit and grace. She used that word grace. And you've certainly shown a lot of grace since you moved away from Parliament, uh, unlike um, your predecessors who enter the domestic fray quite regularly. Was that a conscious decision, not to, to play any politics and step back into it? Yeah, completely conscious. I mean, obviously, I uh, stay across the big trends um, in Australian politics, in global politics, but I'm not um, riveted to 24-hour uh, news TV working out who said what to who 15 minutes ago in Parliament. And I wanted to leave that behind. I mean, I, I joke with people, it's like... Um, you know, it's like getting off the drugs, you know, it's like pulling the needle out of your arm. You know, I'd been on the juice for a lot of years uh, and uh, I'd, I pretty much went cold turkey after the election campaign in 2013. And that means that I can pull back, you know, still read and think, but at this broader level, and I'm happy to share my thoughts at this broader level, but I don't want to drop into that because it to be in that would take me back into the behaviours and back into those times and I don't want to be there. Other things to do. Mm. <laughs> Julia, you said that when, when you resigned, you said that your time as the first female Prime Minister would make it easier for the next one. Now, it's been 10 years since then. We haven't still seen our next female Prime Minister. Why not? Well, I think inevitably we will, but there's a couple of reasons. I mean, politics, uh, you know, politics has got so many uh, random factors in it. Uh, there's so much hard work, there's so much thoughtfulness, there's so much skill, and then there's these random things called timing and luck. Uh, and all of those have to come together in a really unique combination uh, to propel someone to the prime ministership. I mean, I'd, I look back on the, you know, in the days of the Menzies government, you could have been the smartest Labor politician who ever lived, and you would have spent your whole political career in opposition. You know, there's timing and luck. And in order for us to get the next female Prime Minister, the next woman, we need enough women who are in and around the top echelons of politics that when that timing and luck moment comes, that there are a number of women who could step forward. Now, being an ex-Prime Minister, Juliet, you're in a very exclusive club, but it is an exclusive male club. Can you understand why women put off going into politics as a career? Oh, I absolutely can. And I'm really conscious and, you know, I've written, um, you know, when I wrote my story uh, about my time in politics, I wanted to balance up, I wanted to explain the gender issues, but say, politics needs women, women need politics, please still put yourself forward. When I wrote the Women in Leadership book with Ngozi Okonjiri Wheeler, uh, who's now the head of the World Trade Organisation, it is, at the end of the day, a persuasion letter to try and get young women, women of all ages, to put themselves forward for politics. And I want not now, not ever, to be seen in that light too. Uh, I can't, with a straight face, say to any woman thinking of politics, there's no gendered bit, it's all fixed. There's still a gendered bit. But we're very knowing about the gendered bit now. We can, you know, you've seen this movie before, you can war game, you can strategize, you can reach out to others to support you through it. And if you're the kind of person who's driven to put your values into action and to bring change, there's no better seat in the house, there's no better place in the world to do that from than from politics. Even someone who, you know, is in the media and has been our Prime Minister, can you ever really know them? Or do, or do you have a sense of there's something that I need to keep for me? I'm conscious that I am... I'm a person with quite a lot of reserve in in a life that's brought me any amount of exposure. And there's... A, 
there's a sort of weird disjunction in that. And, and people, I mean, I think people think that politicians are natural extroverts, that they're people who want to surf off the energy of the crowd, they're people who need it. And there are politicians like that and, um, you know, sort of all power to them. And I can go out in the world and do things like this and chat to people and I enjoy it. Uh, but there is this sense of, of reserve, this sort of core that that is that I keep to me and I'm just sort of built like that. And I didn't go into politics to do the big you know, whatever the sort of political equivalent of the, the great sort of personality strip tease is, you know, please come and inspect the inner essence of me. I, I went into politics to make a difference, to make a change, to do the things that I believed in. And I don't want you to think that I don't, you know, have a sense of uh, pleasure and assurance and connection in these moments, because I do, but it's at the end of the day not the thing that feeds my inner soul. The thing that feeds my inner soul is, you know, I can look back on the National Disability Insurance Scheme or the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse and say, you know, I was there I don't, I hesitate to say I did that because we did that. Um, it was about more than me, but it is different because I was there. That's what feeds the inner soul. And so for me now in this moment, it's about, you know, what can we do through the Global Institute for Women's Leadership? What can we do through Beyond Blue? What can we do through my other engagements that make change and make a difference? Well said, Julia. Thank you so much for tonight, for your generosity and your openness. Uh, we've all enjoyed it immensely. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Australia's first female Prime Minister, Julie Gillard.